Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Well, first off, congratulations on finishing the Old Testament. It's done and over, out of the way, finally. It's I I love the Old Testament, but when you've been in it for six months, it's it's refreshing to to jump into the New Testament. Uh, so, I'm I'm excited for this. I'm excited to go through this vast period of time from Cyrus the Vespasian with you over the next two days. If you, you, you've you looked at the New Testament and the Old Testament, if, if you've compared them before, you'll notice that the end of the Old Testament is very, very different from the world at the beginning of the New Testament. The Old Testament ends with the Persians still ruling over the Jews, and in some ways the Old Testament finishes with a little bit of a, a disappointing note. When we, when we see the post-exilic prophets and the events of post-exile in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that God has still not returned to the temple. We see that the people are still struggling immensely with sin and that they are still being ruled by a foreign government and we even see that not all of them have chosen to return from exile. We see people choosing to stay in Babylon. And so we, we finish off Nehemiah and the post-exilic prophets in this semi-depressing state where you're wondering, are the people ever going to get it right? And the Persians are in control, and then suddenly the New Testament opens up, and these guys called the Romans are around and in charge, and we very quickly see that the world of the New Testament is very, very different from where we left it in the Old Testament. And when we're reading the New Testament, the Bible doesn't explicitly give us an explanation of how we got there. Matthew doesn't open up with, and over the past 400 years, this is the history that has taken place amongst the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, and now enters Jesus. Um, no, Matthew, Matthew opens up, you get a little bit of an, some Old Testament re references with the, the lineage going on, but overall there's no explanation as to how we got where we are. And it is a moment where we have to be very responsible readers and students of the Bible. And it's where we have to do some research ourselves. It is a moment where it becomes very obvious that the Bible was not originally written to us. We were not its first recipients. To its first recipients, they didn't need this background information. They didn't need to know how the Romans had arrived on the scene because the Romans had, it, that was all history that they knew. So it was, it was obvious to the original recipients of the New Testament how the Romans had got there. That was history that some of them had probably lived and, and were familiar with, and the, the whole political atmosphere and, and religious views, that's, they knew that. And, and so over the next two days, over the next two days, I'm going to attempt to bring you up to speed on everything that has been going on in between the Old and the New Testaments. And to help you understand the world that Jesus lived in, and the cultural mindsets and understandings of his audience and the audiences of the apostles. Now, there is one thing I want to address before we dive into all of this information. This period of time in between the Testaments is frequently referred to as the silence. Have either of you heard that before? Yeah. Yeah. So it's often called the silence by Christians, or the 400 years of prophetic silence. And this is because it is commonly believed that we have no books of our Bible written during this period of time. And that's, of course, dependent really on when you think Daniel was written. And, and so 
people think that because we don't have any books of our Bible written during this time, that God was not speaking during this time. But just because we don't have any books of the Bible written during this time does not mean that God was not speaking to the people. And it most certainly does not mean that God was not at work. In fact, when you study this history, and, and, I, and I hope as we go through this history over the next couple days, I think it becomes more and more clear that God was certainly at work preparing for the perfect time and place to send his son into this world. And so all that said, I think the silence is a very unfortunate term, which can be misleading for many people. Uh, making them think that nothing is going on during this time. But just the basic comparison of the old and the new, where the Old Testament ends and the New Testament begins, it's really easy to see that a lot has been going on in this time. And so for myself, over the past year, I've, I've started to be a little more convicted of that, and I try to use that term less, and so... I will not be using that term throughout this, and that is why I've titled this the intertestamental period, uh, because it's, it's not a time necessarily of silence. Things are going on. God is at work, and though we might not have any new books of our Bible written during this time, I believe God certainly was speaking to some people. So... That's my introduction for this intertestamental period. Uh, before we jump into the Persian period and we talk a little bit about where the Bible, the Old Testament left off, I just want to go over a bit of a review for what you guys can expect over the next couple days, uh, just in case you have any specific questions that want to be answered and are worried, oh, like, he didn't answer it, it today. Will we learn at all? I, I, it might end up in day two. Or if at the end of today you have, like, a question about the political history, you can you can ask me and I can if I don't have uh, it, the information now and don't share it with you today I can try and fit it into tomorrow as well but essentially today day one we are going to go through the political history of the intertestamental period and that will be covering the Persian era the Greek era and the Roman era and the reason I'm doing all the political history at once is because that allows us to kind of string together a timeline and a, an understanding of, uh, of events. And then tomorrow we will talk a bit more specifically about the culture at the time of Jesus at the beginning of the first century. And in that we'll talk about the diaspora, the Jewish religion at the time, Jewish sects and, and Greek mindsets, philosophies and religion how those play into our understanding of the New Testament. And, and so hopefully today we'll provide a timeline and a, and a, a string of events wh that will help us with, with understanding the culture and fitting things into that timeline. So uh, that's my goal for this series. Sound good? All righty. Ready to jump in? All right, here we go. So we start off with the Persian era and the return. This is where the Bible, the, the Old Testament ends and the Persian era continued a little bit more after our Old Testament ends. And we've, we've already talked about this a, a fair bit as we are studying Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the post-exilic prophets. And we, we mentioned that the prophetic promises of Israel's restoration had not yet taken place. Not everyone had chosen to return from exile. God had not returned to the temple. The people were still struggling with sin, and they were being ruled by a foreign government. 
And you guys have now spent nearly six months following the journey of the Israelites, getting into their mindset, trying to understand them. And I don't know if, if you've felt similarly, but I remember when I was a student reading Nehemiah and I just felt so disappointed and frustrated. And I just, you know, sitting there thinking like, come on guys, like exile was supposed to fix this stuff. You went into exile because of your sin, because you weren't turning back and exile was supposed to, to, to turn you back. You were supposed to be on track after that. How are you still struggling with following the law? And, and we begin to get kind of, especially in Daniel, kind of these prods of maybe, maybe the exile, yes, they're back to the land, but maybe the exile isn't fully over yet. They hadn't been back long and they were already defiling the temple, the priesthood, the Sabbath, and oppressing the poor. People like Nehemiah are reminded that these were part of the reason they had been sent into exile. You get uh, passages in, in Nehemiah chapter 1, such as it, chapter 1, 8 to 9, where he's like, remember the word that you commanded your, your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I have chosen to establish my name. And we also see similar sentiments near the end of Nehemiah as well. Nehemiah says in chapter, Nehemiah 13, 17 to 18, he says, Then I remonstrated with the, the nobles of Judah and I said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your ancestors act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring more wrath on evil by prof er, er, on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And so not only do we see the Israelites starting to make this connection of, oh no, the sin problem hasn't been dealt with. Exile didn't fix the sin problem. But we're starting to see this mindset build of, if we don't get this under control, if we don't fix this sin problem, we might end up in exile again. And, and for myself as a student, I, I just, when I re read the, those passages in Nehemiah, the New Testament environment just started to make sense when you see people like the Pharisees who are really strict and holding to the traditions, and, and we'll talk a bit tomorrow specifically about their beliefs, but they, they really believed that they needed to hold, uphold the law uh, as closely as they could in order to bring the Messiah and God's, uh, God's kingdom. And, and, and part of that comes from a place of being scared of going into exile. Like we, it, and they didn't want it to happen again. It had been such a shameful thing. And, and as a result, with that mindset, too, we start to see some nationalism uh, in, in Ezra and Nehemiah as they start expelling foreigners, worried that contact with foreigners and being around foreigners or the people of the land was going to drag them into sin. And they start to get a, kind of these seeds of legalism and... And this, this fear of backsliding, very similar of this fear of going into exile. And I encourage you guys to keep that in mind as we, as we go through this history, because you'll probably begin to see further developments of, of these thoughts and these mindsets. As the people are are ultimately worried about going into exile again. And they are awaiting the fulfillments 
of these prophetic promises that God has made to them. During the Persian period, one of the things that uh, we can also keep in mind, and, and we talked a bit about this in Ezra and Nehemiah, is that this is where Aramaic starts to become big. It's, it's in the Persians that Aramaic starts to kind of be, become the main language. And we'll see that they are still using that language when it comes to the New Testament. You get to the Gospels and there will be specific phrases of Jesus, which they will translate from Aramaic. And they'll even quote his direct Aramaic. This is the Persian Empire. You guys have seen this map before, but just to keep an idea, give, give you an idea of just how much they had conquered in that time. And you'll remember uh, thinking specifically to the political situation. They've got all of this land and in order to govern it, the, the Persians had developed the satrapy system. And so they had satraps or governors set up all around to kind of manage the land and you'll see that the Jews had those governors, and Nehemiah was an example of one of those governors. But even though the province that Judea was in and Jerusalem was in had these governors, there, another thing to keep in mind is that Jerusalem had become somewhat of a, a temple state. And we'll see that as we progress through history, what this, this temple state looks like. And what I mean by that is that the, the, high, the temple itself kind of governed the area of Jerusalem. All right, It kind of governed the city of Jerusalem and the area around it, often through the high priest. The high priest still had a lot of of sway and things going on. We'll see the development of that role as well. And so the this temple state that Jerusalem had, even though it was under a governor, it, it kind of had this semi-independence. Though they still were responsible to report to whatever government was above them, they kind of managed Jerusalem and the area around them. And it'll exist for quite a while. It'll, it'll pretty much be like this up until the Romans. And it will peak with the Hasmoneans, which we'll get to later, uh, where it just it becomes its own full-blown government. And so this is kind of a, a, a review of the Persians and, and the Persian period. We've, as I said, we've talked a lot about the Persians in Daniel and, and Ezra and Nehemiah and the post-exilic prophets. And so I'm not spending too much time on the Persians this morning. But as we mentioned in Daniel, all earthly empires come to an end. And so it did with the Persians. And when the Persian period ended, the Greek period began. In a, roughly 335 BC, Alexander of Macedon, who we would later know as Alexander the Great, became ruler of Macedonia and Greece following the assassination of his father. And Alexander inherited an incredible army from his father. This set him up perfectly for the conquering that was to come. Alexander would very soon go on to conquer the entire Persian Empire and more within only roughly 10 years. Yeah, so this is all, this is the greatest extent that he had for his kingdom. And yeah, 
for, for one army, one country to do that in 10 years continues to be a, a feat that impresses many. And although we don't seem to have events being recorded during this time in our Bible, we do see fulfillments of many prophecies taking place during this time. You'll remember a really notable one is Daniel chapter 8, where we've got the vision of the ram and the goat. So much of that is very clearly fulfilled uh, in this period of time with Alexander the Great. And we see other prophecies, such as the destruction of Tyre in Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel talks about it in chapters 26 to 28. And a lot of that came to fulfillment in Alexander's conquering. And so the Bible might not call out Alexander by name, but Alexander's in there. Uh, So even though... We don't have anything written during this time. We kind of do have some stuff covering it. Now, when it comes to Alexander the Great, something must be said about his methods of conquering. Because they will continue to have a lasting impact well into the time of Jesus and later. Remember that often in creating an empire... It is not only a matter of taking land, but trying to make the peoples under your control conform to your particular lifestyle, which you, because you believe that lifestyle to be right. And we see that throughout all of history, no matter who's doing the conquering. People come in, they kind of, they force their culture, but Alexander did this to an extent that really hadn't been seen before. And also in some ways he was a little more sly about it. It was, there was some people who were actually quite receptive to the way in which he did this. Uh, so first off, Alexander seemed to, seems to have been very polytheistic. I mean, Greek religion was quite polytheistic at the time, but even beyond Greek religion, as he went from place to place, he kind of adopted the religious practices of the areas. And when he went into these different areas, he seemed to have had a pretty good standing with the religious classes in in these different areas. And along with his polytheism, he also seemed to think of himself as a god at different times. So it's a weird conundrum there, but an example of this is as, a, as he goes through, he's, he's not only just respectful of the different religious leanings of people, but he's, as I said, he's adopting them, he's participating in them. When he conquered Egypt, they were really happy to see the Persians gone. Persians had not been nice to the Egyptians. And so when Alexander comes, conquers Egypt, they proclaimed him Pharaoh. Yeah. They made him Pharaoh, which Pharaoh is seen as an incarnation of God for the Egyptians. And in this, he not only made sacrifices to Egyptian gods, but yeah, he was, he was one of their gods himself. When he conquered Babylon, his first act was to meet with the Chaldeans. And as we talked with in, in Daniel, the Chaldeans were kind of the priesthood for the Babylonian gods. And he restored he he not only met with them gotten their their good graces but he restored their temples that had been destroyed and he later did the the act of clasping hands with the the statue of bell or marduk and when you clasped hands this was something that rulers did when they were in Babylon, and it was believed to give the ruler divine powers and had been done by many of the rulers of Babylon before Alexander. 
And of course, when, when I was teaching Daniel, I told you guys about the legend of when Alexander came to Jerusalem. Of course, we're not 100% sure if it happened exactly how it's described in Josephus, but supposedly when Alexander came to Jerusalem, the high priest met him, and Alexander went to the temple and offered sacrifices to Yahweh. And in that, he was also shown the scroll of Daniel, which had predicted his conquest. And as a result, he let the Jews be and let the Jews kind of do their own thing. And part of why I, I lean more towards thinking that this is probably a true story is that it, from what I read of Alexander's conquests and his interactions with the other nations, such as Egypt and Babylon, the story seems very characteristic of Alexander in him coming to the place, acknowledging their religious practices, participating in their religious practices to some extent, and just letting them continue in that way. But although he kind of had this tolerance for religion and he was allowing people to do their own thing religion-wise, there were still many aspects of his culture which he placed upon his conquered peoples. And this is, this is part of how he has this sly technique of kind of bringing his, his culture and, and kind of colonizing these people because, you know, he, he lets them keep something. He's not immediately forcing all of his religious beliefs upon them. He lets these people in these various areas maintain some part of their identity and culture. But wherever he, Alexander conquered, he, the Greek language and culture would begin to be taught. And as he had his people teaching Greek and Greek culture, Greek quickly became the primary language in the, throughout the known world. And it remained the primary language throughout the known world into the time of the New Testament which is exactly why the New Testament was written in Greek, because it was still the main language at that time. And Egypt is probably the best example of this assimilation. As Alexander brought in the language, he also brought in different Greek games. He brought in literary contests and performing. He brought in like Greek performing arts there. And this resulted in a very strong relationship between Greece and Egypt. And there, there became a very large Greek population there, especially in a town called Alexandria, named after Alexander himself. And you will probably hear more about Alexandria as we continue to study the New Testament. But that is a very Greek part of Egypt. He had this policy as he was conquering called conquest through civilization. And along with teaching these things in these, these countries, he would set up Greek, brand new Greek cities. And Alexandria was one of those. He, in, in all, he set up approximately 70 of these new Greek cities throughout the empire. And you, since you set up this city and it's near these other areas you've conquered and you've got this new city you've made is fully Greek, that eventually begins to rub off on the other areas and it's a way of kind of spreading the culture even more. Again, a little sneakily in some ways because he's not forcing it upon every single city uh, super harshly. And this was part of a process called Hellenization. And you'll want to get familiar with that term. I will put it on the board, actually. Hellenization. And this, this is the process of kind of Greekifying a culture. And it would continue for centuries. And when we enter the New Testament, they're going to speak of Hellenists. 
and this is where the term comes from at the beginning of Acts specifically we're going to have instances where the Hebrew speaking Jews and the they'll just be called the Hellenists but the Hellenists are Greek speaking Jews they're not getting along um, or actually it was Hebrew Christians at that point at the beginning of Acts and Greek speaking Christians and so that is when you hear that term, when you it, Hellenists or Hellenization, it, it has to do with people who are uh, either speak Greek or part of Greek culture. But of course, Alexander too, even though Alexander is amazing, he's conquered all of this world within 10 years, he's only 33 but he too would eventually fall. And in 323 BC, while he's staying in Babylon, in the, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, you'll remember in Daniel, we looked at that beautiful blue tile that he liked to use. Alexander the Great, while he was there, fell ill for unknown reasons. There's a few different theories out there. Some people think that he was poisoned other people think that, you know, he's been in war for 10 years and it probably just took a toll on his body. Uh, but people are, are free to speculate. But either way, he fell ill. And as he lay on his deathbed in 323 BC, surrounded by his officers, legend has it that he was asked to whom he is leaving his empire. And when he was asked this question, it is said his answer was, to the best. Um, some believe, though, that he did not actually say, to the best. In, in Greek, the, the word for best is kratisto. But at the time, one, his second in command's name was Craterus, which in the Greek is kratero. So you have Bessis Cretisto and uh, Craterus is Cretero. And so some people think that it was misheard and he was actually saying that he was leaving his empire to Craterus. Um, but we don't know for sure. Like I said, there's a lot of legend surrounding that. If it is the case that he actually said Craterus and not to the best, then people were deliberately interpreting it to mean the best as as his as he had passed and as his empire kind of split up and people were vying for power so with that alex with those being his final words alexander the great died at 33 years old Shame. yep poor guy rest in peace um and this began the wars of the diadochi yeah, the Diadochi. That's D I A uh, D O C H I. I knew it. I was like, it's going to have a C H for a C. Yeah, Diadochi. Yeah. So the wars of the Diadochis begin, and that's when the, the generals and the governors of Alexander's army begin to fight over who is going to have control of the empire. And there, the wars of the Diadochi are complicated to follow. There's a lot that goes on because there's so many parties. And so we could spend two days just walking through the wars of the Diadochi. Um, the first couple of years especially had a lot going on. There was uprisings in Greece, and some people wanted to see if Alexander's pregnant widow would bear a son. Uh, at the same time, those the, the other people were sitting there going like, okay, even if she does have a son, uh, some were saying that son was illegitimate because it was not from a Greek wife. Uh, that and who are we going to, we're just going to wait another 10 years for this kid to grow up and, and then take over or something. So a lot of people vying for power, a lot of politics going on, a lot of fighting going on. At one point, Perdiccas, who was appointed regent, 
uh, over the area was sending the body of Alexander to Greece. And Alexander was going to be buried in Greece. But then Ptolemy <laughs> decided that he didn't want Alexander's body buried in Greece. And so while Alexander's body is kind of crossing over in this area here, uh, Ptolemy comes up and steals the body of Alexander and brings it to Egypt and they bury Alexander in Egypt. Yeah. And then Perdiccas, uh, who was this regent originally sending the body, he would then get assassinated and then Alexander's number two would eventually die in, in, in battle. And anyways, the wars of the Diadochi would continue to go on from 322 to 281 BC. You guys have that uh, kind of it, that timeline from Daniel that covers a lot of those. It, it has those dates on there as well. And as I said, very, very complicated to go through all the wars of the Diadochi. But by the end, there were four main kingdoms that had been established. And that the, these four Greek uh, kingdoms are the, the kingdom of Ptolemy, who was mainly based in Egypt. You had the, the kingdom of Seleucus that kind of had the, the Far East. And then you had the kingdom of Lishmachus, um, who had some of like Macedonia, Asia Minor, and then the kingdom of Cassander, who had Greece. But the important ones for us to remember out of these are the kingdoms of Seleucus or the Seleucid Empire and the kingdom of Ptolemy or the Ptolemaic Empire because those are the ones directly connected to Judea and they are the ones who will fight over Judea for a while. So once the wars of the Diadochi had kind of settled down a little bit, the Ptolemies were the first to have control over the land of Judea around it, so they had control over Judea from approximately 281 BC to 189 BC. And it is around this time that it is said the Jews in Egypt asked for a Greek edition of their scriptures. The Hellenization had come to the point where there were a lot of Jews who now spoke Greek and might have spoken more Greek than they spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. And so they th thought to themselves, you know what would make it a lot easier for us if we had a translation of our scriptures in the Greek language. And there's, a, th there's some ideas as to how that came about. Some people think that it was originally the, the Jews that pushed for this. Some people think it was more the, the Ptolemies themselves that kind of pushed to have this copy of the scripture. But either way, it's around this time that it happens. And if the claims are correct, uh, it is in this environment of the Ptolemaic rule that approximately 70 elders came, went from Jerusalem to Alexandria in Egypt to oversee the translation of the Pentateuch into Greek. And this became what we know as the Septuagint. All right. I'll spell Septuagint. Yeah, yeah. So Septuagint, um, I was just about to write the Greek. Okay. <laughs> Wrong one. Or not the Greek, the Roman numerals. So Septuagint, in case you don't have it already, is spelled S-E-P-T. Uh, I've lost it on here. <sighs> oh my gosh. U-A-G-I-N-T. But uh, because, so Septuagint means the 70. And this has to do with the, the 70 elders. Now, supposedly there's actually 72. Yeah, but they, they ran it off to 70. 
And so the Greek, the Roman numerals for 70 is LXX. And so when you see LXX, that's people talking about the Septuagint. All right. Yeah. So uh, most of the, the reason why I struggle so much with spelling the word Septuagint is because I usually don't. I usually just cheat and write LXX all the time. And so even when I say Septuagint and I'm spelling it, I even <laughs> write L It's just a weird. But anyways, so if you see LXX anywhere, that's what they're talking about. And so, as I said, the, the Septuagint, or LXX, was originally just the writings of the Pentateuch. That, that's how it started. But eventually, over time, the other books of the Old Testament would also be translated and be kept with it and be considered part of it. And they would add those. They'd also add some apocryphal books as well. But and those two started to be known as the Septuagint. So most of the time when someone says Septuagint, they're talking about just the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But originally, it just meant the first five books. But this is a very, very important development when it comes to the history of the Jews during the intertestamental period. And that is because the Septuagint would be the version of scripture that we see quoted most of the time throughout the New Testament. They use both the Hebrew and, and the Greek sometimes, but the Greek is used quite a bit. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing to happen when the Ptolemies had control over the land of Judea. And then, of course, came the Seleucids, who took over the land of Judea in 198 BC under Antiochus III. Oh, it's not that Antiochus yet. Yeah, this is Antiochus III, who took over the, the area in 198 BC. And we did talk about this period a fair bit when studying the book of Daniel. But it's a few years later still under the Seleucids, that we are introduced to the ruler Antiochus IV, not the third, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Oftentimes, people just refer to him as Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes meaning God manifest. And so he is, again, one of those many rulers we see throughout history who think that they are a god. One of his earlier interactions with the Jews was around 175 BC. And remember earlier I was talking about how Jerusalem had become a bit of a temple state. They had their various governments that were over them, but Jerusalem the, and, and the, the priesthood, the high priesthood, kind of ran the show in that region. And Antiochus was one of the first people that, that kind of noticed that it that amount of influence and Antiochus decided he wanted to have more control over the office of the high priest. And so up until this point, the office of the high priest, from my understanding, had relatively normal levels of succession through the line of Zadok, similar to as we had seen taking place throughout the, the Old Testament. But Antiochus steps in and he deposes Onius III as high, uh, high priest. And so he, he says, sorry, Onius, you're not high priest anymore. And he makes Jason, Onius' brother, high priest. And he makes Jason high priest because Jason had bribed Antiochus. Yeah. However, Jason had his own agenda. And Jason was much more on the side that they should be Hellenizing the culture of Judah and making it more Greek. And he was planning to make it more Greek, but there was a guy named Menelaus who didn't like that so much. So Menelaus also bribes Antiochus to become high priest, 
and Menelaus, in ha becoming high priest, assassinates Onius III, who was kind of the rightful high priest, per se. And then Menelaus did not remain high priest for very long. He himself ends up being deposed, and Jason becomes high priest again. But even Jason didn't last very long before Jason ends up fleeing to Egypt. All right? And it is around this time that Antiochus IV was fighting with the Ptolemies in Egypt and trying to expand his borders. And in the process, he wanted to have a better grip on Judea to make sure he had this Judea kind of as a buffer against Egypt. And in 169, roughly, roughly 169, 167, he decided to sack the temple. So he goes into Jerusalem and he enters the sanctuary of the temple and he strips the temple of its gold and utensils for worship. And we talked a little bit about this when we were studying the book of Daniel. These, this is where we see the beginning of events in the book of 1 Maccabees. And a couple years later, after he sacked the temple, Antiochus then sends his men to plunder the city again before a very heavy push of assimilating and Hellenizing the Jews. And so you'll remember from uh, 1 Maccabees, they had, in part of this process of uh, uh, Hellenization, they set up uh, a Greek gymnasium in a... Uh, in Jerusalem, and of course that was very offensive to the Jews. Greek sports happen naked, and so they set up that. And also we see in 1 Maccabees that when they plundered the city, they had burned down a lot of the, uh, the city. He, they tore down its houses, they tore down its walls, they took women and children and livestock captive, and they tried to force the worship of the Greek gods. They stopped sacrifices to Yahweh in the temple, and they erected the desolating sacrifice or desolating sacrilege on the temple altar. And they also tried, they even tried to stop people from circumcising their sons uh, and, and killed people who wouldn't conform. And so, ultimately, they were trying to completely eliminate the Jewish religion. And even in that, remember, Antiochus thought he was a god. Antiochus even tried to set up worship of himself. So all this takes place, and the Jews wouldn't have it. This led, as we've talked about before, this led to the Maccabean Revolt led by Judas Maccabeus. And Judas Maccabeus was this guerrilla leader of sorts who led uh, this, this revolt against the Greeks, and he initiated a variety of attacks that managed to wear out the forces of Antiochus IV. And this eventually led to the Maccabees reclaiming the temple, which they had been uh, driven from and which had been desecrated. And they reclaimed the temple and consecrated it three years to the day since its desecration by Antiochus IV. And, and so that was December 25th, 164 BC, that uh, that they cleanse the temple. That's how they celebrated Christmas. December twenty fourth. Twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Uh, one sixty four B C. And they did not celebrate Christmas well, because it was not a thing. I know no. Yeah. That that's why Hanukkah is at the around the same time as. Uh, as our Christmas, because Hanukkah oh, okay. is the, the, the Jewish holiday celebrating this event. All right. 
and we see that this is still, we see it also referred to as the Festival of Lights. I believe it's in the Gospel of John. We see that, uh, I think it was Jesus was in Jerusalem for, the, for this, this festival. So this is, this is history still very much fresh in the minds of the Jews when we enter the New Testament. So Judas Maccabeus has started this revolt. And as other wars were going on in the north, the Seleucid kingdom was slowly falling apart. And between this and the rise of the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, so the descendants of the, the Maccabees, started to be known as the Hasmoneans. And the Hasmoneans became the governing authority over the temple state of Jerusalem. And they began to accumulate more and more power in this, in this process to the point where in 142 BC they achieved full independence. And during this time, they not only kind of got their independence over the area of Jerusalem, but they were fighting and leading wars of expansion for their territory to the point where they managed to extend their borders to the point of reclaiming all of the promised land and more at one point. So this map here that I have on the screen, this is a map that shows us the history of the expansions of the, the Has Hasmonean kingdom. And so at the beginning of the Maccabean revolt, you be, they they are just they just have control over this green area of Jerusalem and then they begin to add the this yellow area under Jonathan their leader Jonathan and then more and more until all of this area that you see they had control of and so they had essentially retaken all the promised land for for quite a time but there was, the, the, some of the Jews were very excited about the fact that they, were, they now had this kingdom of their own. Remember, when we leave the Old Testament, there's kind of this disappointment because they're still being governed by foreign rulers. They don't have a kingdom of their own. But suddenly, under the Hasmoneans, they have their own kingdom. They have their own land, and they are in control again. But although some people are very excited about this, there was also an aspect to the Hasmonean rule that was troubling for people. If we remember back to the book of Samuel, when you, you open up, you start the book of Samuel, and the priests at the time are Eli and his sons, and they were very corrupt. And as a result, their line is cut off, and the line of Zadok is eventually chosen to carry out the high priesthood. However, when the Maccabees had established control, they chose not to instate a high priest from the line of Zadok. Onius IV, who was the son of Onius III, who had been assassinated earlier, Onius IV was the last legitimate heir to the line of Zadok. But instead of choosing him, the Maccabees chose a guy named Alchemus, who was not of the high priestly line. And so eventually, Onius IV decided to leave and go to Egypt, and he actually set up his own alternative temple in an area called Leontopolis of Egypt. And that ends the, the line uh, of Zadok, essentially. There's... After that, there is no, after Onius III, there is never a legitimate high priest of the line of Zadok. The Maccabees and the Hasmoneans at this point continued to be the ones selecting the high priests to the point where actually many of the Hasmonean kings themselves also served 
as high priest. If we look at this chart that I've got up, this is the Hasmonean dynasty, and Matthias is the dad of Judas Maccabeus and all his brothers. And Matthias kind of seen as the patriarch, but he dies really early on in the revolt. And then Judas Maccabeus at some point, though at one, it, the, the first high priest they choose is this guy called Alchemist. He didn't stay high priest forever. Judas Maccabeus um, at one point was a high priest. His brother Jonathan at one point was a high priest, and Simon was at one point a high priest, while also kind of being the rulers of Jerusalem and this temple state. All right, They were kind of these priest kings. And then at some points there are times where you have a high priest or who is not the ruler, and so... In that case, you had John Hyrcanus, who was, he ruled, but he was never a high priest. Um, and we don't officially see another high priest slash king again until Hyrcanus II. But this was, this was a big problem for many of the Jews, a real big point of contention for them. Many of them saw this as a violation of what the priesthood should be. They didn't feel that the, the office of king and high priest should be the same. They felt one was a religious office and one was a political office. But now the lines were starting to really be blurred. Some of the Jews also didn't agree with all the conquests that were going on. In fact, in these conquests, they were even forcing conversion to Judaism. And so some of the Jews who didn't agree uh, would leave and set up al alternative Jewish communities. Uh, there was another one put in Egypt called Elephantine. And there was also one in Qumran that was started up. And it is in this era that we see the high priests stop being selected based on Zadokite lineage and become selected by rulers, either through bribes or to be used as political pawns. And so the high priesthood in this era of the, of the Greeks really transitions from being a strictly religious office to becoming pretty much a political office. And we see this political aspect of the priesthood specifically play out near the end of the Hasmonean kingdom as Rome enters the scene. And this particular transition and political maneuvering amongst the, the Hasmoneans is what eventually leads to the rise of the Herods. Now, that, this, as we come to the end of the, the Greek period, we're, we're about to enter the Roman period. Uh, but before we jump into the Roman period, I'm going to plug my computer in and we're going to take a five minute break. <laughs> 